Now a few words of introduction about our special guests tonight, William Patrick and Philip Morris, whom I'm very fortunate to call friends and colleagues for a long time. The format for this evening will be a brief reading by Bill Patrick from his new book, Metrofix, The Combative Comeback of a Company Town. Copies are for sale. Uh, Susan Novotny of the Bookhouse is here tonight. It'd be great if you wanted to pick up a copy, and Bill will be happy to sign them afterwards as well. After the reading, uh, Bill and Philip and I will have a conversation, then we'll leave, leave time for a Q&A afterwards. Um, first, a few words about Bill Patrick. Metrofix is a detailed account of the rise, fall, and resurgence of Schenectady in the context of urban planning and new urbanism. Author Dinty Moore called the book, quote, a meticulously researched compelling story, and quote, an essential book for anyone interested in the lifestyle of city centers and how urban planning can succeed, end quote. Patrick is an acclaimed writing teacher. I should mention he led many successful writing workshops at the Writers Institute over the years. And he's also an award-winning writer. He's published nine books in several genres, including poetry, memoir, nonfiction. He's also a playwright and a screenwriter. He's taught for the past 12 years in Fairfield University's low residency MFA writing program. He and his wife, Carmel, live in Schenectady. Philip Morris is the CEO of Proctor's, the performing arts complex in downtown Schenectady, and Proctor's Collaborative, which now includes the new Capitol Rep Theater in Albany and Universal Preservation Hall in Saratoga Springs. I should also note he's taught here at UAlbany as an adjunct in the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy. He serves as a Tony Awards voter, which means he makes frequent trips to New York City to, to watch the latest musicals and plays on Broadway. He came to Proctor's in 2002 after 25 years leading the Chautauqua County Arts Council in Jamestown, New York. Please welcome Bill Patrick and Philip Morris. How you doing? I can't see you because it's bright up here, but thanks for coming out on this cold night. I'm not going to read a whole lot. I'm going to read a little bit because uh, we have a lot to talk about, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions. But I want to kind of set the tone, which is not just talking about urban planning or Schenectady's resurgence, but really is talking about what the arts mean to a community. That's what, what we're really here tonight for. So chapter nine, chapters 9 and 10 in this book are about Proctor's. Chapter 9 is more about the history of it with F.F. Um, Proctor and how Proctor's got started. Chapter 10 starts with Philip coming to town and talks about um, how he got everything going at Proctor's. So I'm going to read a little from the beginning of 9 and then jump to a couple of other quick things. Chapter 9 is called Can the Arts Save Schenectady? And there's an epigraph from The Art Spirit by Robert Henri. There are moments in our lives, there are moments in a day, when we seem to see beyond the usual. Such are the moments of our greatest happiness. Such are the moments of our greatest wisdom. If one could but recall his vision by some sort of sign, it was in this hope that the arts were invented, signposts on the way to what may be signposts toward greater knowledge. How should we define urban revitalization? Does new life for a city depend primarily on thriving businesses, good job opportunities, and economic development? It goes without saying that cities, like people, can't survive without adequate financial resources, but is fiscal security the only essential criterion for measuring quality of life? What must the city offer its citizens beyond public safety, garbage collection, code enforcement, and a functioning infra infrastructure to convince them to build their lives there? What places and events can help increase the sense of belonging in a community? And will political leaders display the knowledge and courage to prioritize and fund aesthetic and cultural endeavors? If they can't or won't, who will step up? 
and what balance of individual entrepreneurship and self-selecting community involvement can ensure a successful and lasting aesthetic life. So that kind of sets, sets the tone for this chapter, but the chapter is really about stories. And one of the longest stories told here is F.F. F. Proctor, who um, built the Proctor Theater that we know, that Philip directs right now, uh, in 1926. And so I'm just going to read a, a very, very short, like one page, kind of rundown of what vaudeville acts were then, because that's how Proctor made his, his living and how he did so well. Refusing to be outdone in the fantasy department by the moguls in Hollywood and New York City, F.F. F. Proctor was determined to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with William Fox, the Warner Brothers, Marcus Lowe, and even Roxy Rockefeller. All of them were well aware they were selling tickets to the palaces as much as to the shows. Vaudeville was still in its heyday, though, even as the mid-1920s saw a broad increase in movie audiences expanding from the lower classes to include a growing middle-class population. Crowds seemed to cherish the startling assortment of variety acts as they flocked again and again to see the famous and the bizarre. Lillian Russell and other opera stars, Carrie Nation handing out souvenir axes, ukulele virtuosos, bow and arrow acts, midget impersonators, tabletop tap dancers, magicians who wore voluminous coats and filled the stage with the folded up furniture they pulled from them, knife throwers, sneeze experts, fake Chinese yodelers, stand-up comic duos, banjo masters, animal acts like a chimpanzee leading a donkey on a leash in circles around the stage. Musical spoon experts, mayhem acrobats, street singers, famous regurgitators who could swallow molten lead and vomit up spendable coins, giant xylophonists, plate spinners, strong men supporting human pyramids, pet rats blowing kazoos, amazing child tumblers, all Asian orchestras, and even playing to the haircut harpists who were expected to hustle people toward the exits. If you didn't like a particular act, no need to worry. Something different would always appear quickly. The unspoken elixir of vaudeville was speed. If an act went longer than 10 minutes, out came the hook. Its effect was extraordinary and counterintuitive simultaneously. It afforded everyone a communal experience, which also felt, in the very same instant, intimate for every person in the audience. Those hoofers were playing only for each one of them. The theater critic John Lahr summed up the immigrant appeal of the art form, quote, the touching thing about vaudeville was it was like first generation America, getting a foothold in the world of America, celebrating it, suffering it, and giving all that longing and the high times to the people, giving it back, unquote. And once the talkies showed up in 1927 with Al Jolson and the jazz singer, the crowds got even bigger. Who could resist talking pictures? Okay, we're gonna jump 50 years ahead. Proctor's opened 1926. Within about five or six years, most of the vaudeville palaces in the country were closed. Uh, Proctor's in Schenectady was not, uh, for, for a number of reasons. For one thing, GE, was, GE and Alco were really going um, great guns. And it was a big population. They had 95 to 100,000 people in Schenectady until the, the late 1950s, um, when the layoffs started. And that's, at that time, for once again a number of reasons, that's when Proctor started to decline a little bit. But the city couldn't avoid life-changing social and cultural changes forever, and Proctor's theater began to decline in the early 1960s. The private owner tried a few gimmicks, afternoon Disney cartoon festivals, black exploitation and martial arts films, midnight matinees, and even a month's long run as a porno house. But while the unpaid utility bills and the back taxes mounted higher and higher, finally reaching over 200,000 by 1972, the unfixed holes in the roof had damaged the interior so badly that City Hall ordered the building to be boarded up to avoid potential liability. Ignored, the theater continued to implode, and around it, State Street was turning into a ghost town. 
Finally, in 1977, the city seized the theater and scheduled its demolition. The days when Proctor's Theater felt crucial to the cultural life of Schenectady not only seemed distant, but the crumbling movie palace had also become an eyesore in the middle of the 400 block, ground zero for Canal Square, the urban mall that promised to rescue the city's downtown. When Marty Moore, Catherine Rosendahl, and fellow members of the Schenectady Arts Council learned of the impending demolition, they jumped into action, determined to get the building listed on the Register of National Historic Places to save it. They had not forgotten when the plaza, the other ornate movie palace in Schenectady, had been torn down in 1964 just to make a parking lot, and they couldn't bear to lose the only remaining theatrical landmark in the city. The leaders at City Hall weren't swayed by their conservationist arguments, but they did grant a temporary stay of execution. As Marilyn Sassy recounts it, they said, look, prove to us you can at least patch it up enough to put on a real show. If you can actually sell tickets and get people to come, we'll help. However, a few people had set foot in Proctor's for several years. Again, Marilyn Sassy explains. They came into the theater for the first time, these members of the Arts Council, and they couldn't believe it. The rugs were sodden, soaked through, and torn so badly that if you tripped and fell into one of the holes in that carpet, you'd never be seen again. The seats were dilapidated and horribly damaged. All the wonderful scagliola was literally falling apart because it was just plaster, of course. But the thing that really got me, when they reached right at the heart of the midsection, right there under the dome where you look up and there was that beautiful chandelier, everything was coming apart. The plaster was coming down. And what was worse, back above the last seats on the balcony, there was a hole in the roof big enough that they could see the sky. And pigeons had gotten in, were roosting in both the box seats on either side of the theater and flying back and forth. Now this was where they all started to wonder how they could pull this off. In spite of the theater's woeful condition, Moore and Rosendahl accepted the restoration challenge, but first things first. They had to incorporate Proctor's as a nonprofit, which they named the Arts Center and Theater of Schenectady Incorporated, ACTS, ACTS, and then raise a pile of money. A fundraiser netted 7,000, City and federal grants provided half a million more to make the structure operationally safe again. After that, they set in to repair the theater itself, and the city offered a 13-member CETA contingent, its Schenectady Employment and Training Administration workers. They were, for the most part, unskilled laborers who were subsidized by a government-sponsored program, vaguely akin to the Works Project Administration workers, WPA, who'd pitched in during the Great Depression to chronicle and help rebuild the country. While volunteers refurbished the damaged seats that were too expensive to replace at that point, the CETA workers erected a maze of scaffolding so they could clean and paint. They could handle the basic restoration jobs, but a more skilled workforce had to fix the technical systems in the theater. Joe Mangino, in charge of all the labor unions at General Electric during that time, convinced GE to donate the skills of the best members of their electrical, plumbing, audio, and engineering unions to restore Proctor's primary systems. Women from the Carl Company's drapery department used scraps from the damaged stage curtain to make burgundy booties trimmed with lace and sold them as Christmas decorations, raising money they gave to the theater. The Carl Company, which owned the building next door to Proctor's, donated all the material for a new velvet curtain and for the padded wall tapestries and covered their employees' labor as well. In the end, Proctor's also sported a new roof and sprinkler system, three new boilers, and safety railings along the balcony. Audience members had been allowed to smoke for 40 years in the theater. The tar and nicotine and the cigarettes and cigars had eaten into the unique, pl unique plaster work, but Axe was able to locate a grandson of the original plaster artist from Florence. He came to Schenectady and trained local masons to refurbish the magnificent Corinthian columns, as well as the rest of the scarred Scagliola. And for the all-important show, Marty Moore was able, through a Broadway agent contact of hers, to secure the well-known illusionist, Harry M. Blackstone, Jr., whose famous magician father had played Proctor several times in its heyday. 
A capacity crowd of 2,700 people purchased tickets for the theater saving event that was open to the public on January 3rd, 1979. Mayor Frank Ducey, suddenly a believer, accepted one dollar from Axe President Rosendahl and handed her the keys to Proctor's Theater. Dennis Madden, the brand new executive director, checked the stage supports one more time for the finale of Blackstone's act, making his trained elephant, Misty, disappear in plain sight. However, as the curtain rose to cheers from the excited audience, the tired plumbing in the newly burdened restrooms in back let loose, and water began streaming down the aisles. Luckily, Dennis Madden knew where the main shutoff valve was in the basement, so the show could go on. Outside the theater, though, as the magic show inside dazzled the crowd, a blizzard buried the cars in the parking lot. For a bonus trick, though, Blackstone put a harness on Misty, and she towed all the cars out to the plowed street. Not much had been easy reaching that night, but Proctor's had been saved. One person alone can't make a city worth living in, of course. But F.F. Proctor made something that not only entertained generations in Schenectady, but even in its darkest era, also inspired Axe members and many others in the community to come together and show what they valued most. Art in all its forms is crucial to a society because art is an essential ingredient in empowering our hearts. Art promotes communication, fosters optimism, and creates jobs. Art pushes us to see beyond the necessities of survival and ministers to our emotional and mental well-being. Art can connect us deeply and forge compassion and, as it does, becomes a barometer of cultural sophistication, a civilizing endeavor for the makers and for those who can appreciate what's been made. And the arts bring people to the city, people who eat in restaurants before a show and talk about what they saw afterwards in bars and cafes. Arts venues are revitalizing engines. To lose theaters that are remarkable historic buildings in which may well be multi-use performing arts models and cultural centers for an entire community and region underscores a negligence that diminishes our lives. But if a city can locate its inspirational touchstones as Schenectady has and continue to rescue them and renew them again and again, the shared aesthetic legacy that results may continue to inspire people and broadcast a higher quality of life in a particular place. Thank you for that reading, Bill. That was a, a great uh, overview. It's, it's an amazing book. Uh, four years of work and hundreds of interviews and um, uh, it's a really important book for Schenectady but apparently we only get 10 minutes or the hooks coming out is that true Philip and uh, and and can you spin plate plates or swallow fire or whatever um, <laughs> hey, hey, hey look and is it any different than YouTube you know it's true I mean, it's, it's it's true this is today's vaudeville but I um, I want to talk first uh, both of you are so-called newcomers to Schenectady. I think you've lived there about 10 years, Bill. You've yeah. been there about 20. You came from Troy. You came from Jamestown. I'm trying to find the quote in the book that Bill uses that your friend, the mayor of Jamestown, said when you were going to take this job. And I wrote it down. It's, it's a classic. Yes, yeah, Sam Teresi, Jamestown mayor, tells you, Philip, I think you're walking into a nightmare. Politics in Schenectady are probably the worst in America. I've never seen anything worse. It's personal. And it's bitter there. Good luck. <laughs> was this your friend? And, and what, did you know what you were getting into in 2002, I guess it was? Uh, not exactly. I, um, it was what he saw, thought, as he worked to the city and throughout the state. Sam uh, was mayor there for 26 years, so for quite a long time, retiring only three or four years ago. But he would come to the statewide conferences, especially 12, 14 years ago, not at the very beginning. And he would remind me of what he said and then say, and I was wrong. This worked. Nice, nice. Um, Bill, you've written about Troy. You grew up there. Troy has its own version of 
challenging politics. Anything did you see when you started researching Schenectady? And you talk about you didn't know the history of Schenectady. It was all, you know, learning it. Did you see any parallels or, or similar to Schenectady by itself in, in the capital region? Yeah, that, that's a tough question. Um, when I was in Troy, when I came back to Troy, I came back to actually ride with the fire department, specifically so I could ride Saving Troy. And um, so I saw the city from the bottom up. In Schenectady, I tend to see the city not from the bottom up so much. Uh, my wife is a city councilwoman, and the mayor lives down the street. So I, I, I see a very different kind of person in Schenectady that I did in Troy. In Troy, it was three in the morning with um, people flashing knives and gutters. So it was, a, it, was, it was a different place. But Troy has the, you know, the Arts Council of the Capital Region. Um, and, and a lot of other great stuff, and it's got impact and RPI and all the stuff that happens there. They're not terribly dissimilar cities, I don't think, except that Troy never seems to be able to get its act together. And Schenectady, I think, has gotten its act together, mostly because of Metroplex and having a devoted funding stream for an economic development authority. That's the big difference. So how does Metroplex work so well in Schenectady compared to, I know other cities have tried it. I don't know if Jamestown had something similar. Nobody has anything it? like it. Okay. So, so what makes it unique? It's a percent of sales tax. Um, uh, it's a New York State Authority with the right to raise a half a percent of sales tax, which amounts to about six, seven million dollars a year uh, that is dedicated toward development. There is nothing else like it. Uh, but I want to add that Proctors and most of what's happened in Schenectady in the last 20 years is a remarkable, remarkable blend of incentive from Metroplex or the state or things available to any community uh, and private investment of significance. Um, I'm amazed because we raised a lot of money. We have to. We had to for the project. It was $44 million all total, and uh, Metroplex was $9.5 million of that. Critical. The first big gift made us look real. Uh, at the same time, we raised $11 million from individuals. What I know about Schenectady, which I don't see in the rest of the capital region, is that people who were born and raised in Schenectady, often from you know what are now lousy neighborhoods, you know Hamilton Hill or or uh, Bellevue, which isn't a lousy neighborhood, but but were born and raised and ended up being very successful in their lives and don't live in Schenectady any longer, but put their wallets in Schenectady, and it's an amazing, amazing thing to me, and I don't see that in Albany, and I don't see that in Saratoga, I don't see that. I don't know well enough in Troy, but Schenectadians never left in a funny way. I mean, your book really digs into so many ordinary people, community activists, just describing that scene, you know, in, in renovating and, and, and bringing Schenect the Proctors back in 1979. Is it... Do you see it the way that Philip does, that this is a city that really cares and digs in on a deep personal level? Yeah, over and over again that's happened. It happened in 1886, actually. That's why Schenectady developed. Um, GE, Thomas Edison had a machine shop on Gork Street in Manhattan. It was a tiny machine shop. They had to run um, the belts off of the main shaft. They had to run the belts out the window so that the machine lathes could be on the sidewalk. It was that small. And they had a strike, and he said, all right, that's it, I'm leaving town. So he sent guys out in three or four, three directions, actually, and the guy who went north ended up going by Schenectady by mistake and saw this big field next to the Erie Canal near the Mohawk River, which had two brand new buildings on it. A guy named Walter McQueen had actually put those buildings up. He had broken away from the Schenectady Locomotive Company and he wanted to start his own company. But the guy who, uh, who basically sponsored him died and then he got lured back to the Locomotive Company. So here are these two brand new buildings on a really large plane next to a transportation source. He went back to Edison and Edison said, okay, well, let's buy it. He offered 37.5, they wanted 45.5 for it. And the people of Schenectady got together and raised 8,000 bucks. 
which in 1886 was a hell of a lot of money. And so that's the only re reason Edison went there. And GE is the only reason that it developed. So GE is, is you know, at the core of everything that's happened in Schenectady since then. The booms and the busts. It's often painted as a villain, you know, um, trying to reduce its tax assessment by tearing down buildings, massive layoffs, clashing with unions. You cover it all very fairly in the book. Um, where do you think GE stands in terms of proctors in the arts? A lot of those gifts probably came from GE retirees who had a nice pension, probably came from, certainly came from Neil Golub, who we should mention, you know, underwrote the research and publication of this book and also a significant benefactor and donor to proctors and everything going on in Schenectady. But what is the role that you see GE in terms, since you've been here, proctors, and then through the long sweep of history, I'd like to ask you, because it seems like you, you give percentages and, and uh, census data. I mean, every 10 years, they could double or triple the population. And then in the bad years, it could drop 20, 30% population, depending on how GE was hiring. But first year, how do you see GE? Does it have much of a role in Proctor's history in the last 20 oh, years? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, one, one, one horse towns, one company towns, obviously go, go up and down but based on that town but the Schenectady is also interesting because I describe the region as a suburb surrounded by cities not a city surrounded by suburbs and really the capital region the center of the capital region is Clifton Park I mean you can't avoid that reality and if you live in Clifton Park you can be in any of the four major cities in minutes um, only because of that reality is Proctor's here because Schenectady could never deliver 2,700 people a night for a week to see come from away or anything else. It wouldn't happen. So we are a regional enterprise and that was harder 70 years ago before automobiles for all their ill made it possible for people to think of the region like that. But now we're in the reality that according to the CDTA, something like 60% of the working people of the region live in one place, one county, and work in another. It's kind of remarkable. Um, so GE's influence was bigger when transportation sort of things made it more difficult to think regionally and its its role is smaller today by miles clearly though its investment in Schenectady is so huge between the research facility and the facilities on the main campus some of which are beautiful new facilities and renovated facilities and are around solar energy and managing all the the wind turbines that they've installed around the world and I mean, I'm hard pressed to believe GE will ever not be in Schenectady. That's a big statement to make, um, but I'm hard pressed to believe it because they have to abandon so much. Now, my my story for Proctor's is that when I got here, GE City relationships were terrible. Uh, so I think it was the I got here the year after Mayor Drzinski had the the, the sign thanking. Uh, GE for the City Hall. I don't even remember that story, but there was a stone plaque and it was removed. It was all pissy relationship. I remember my friend Sam Teresi. You know, this, this is all personal. But I spent three years working with senior leadership at GE who gave me access, who I'll never forget. She, um, Jan Smith called me one day and I was on Not Terrace right where the Golub building is now. Uh, not Not Terrace, not, not Street. Right where the Golub building is now but it was a vacant building, crap place. And I pulled over because I wanted to take the phone call and she made an enormous pledge from GE for what became the GE Theater, and it ended up being around $650,000. And there hadn't been a gift like that from GE and its family, I would say, in 25 years before that. My next call after Jan called me was to call Ray and say, Ray Gillen from Metroplex, there's a signal here 
they would not be doing this unless they're making a statement. And it was pretty amazing. Yeah. You're a little tougher on the Jack Neutron, Jack Welch years. You kind of kick them around a little bit here, um, but you also praise them at different times. How do you see GE big picture, 30,000 foot view for Schenectady and for the arts? It's a long question. I know you got a lot of chapters devoted to it. But. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it a short, short version. Um, GE from, it was formed in 1892. And um, Edison was bought out in 1892. It had nothing to do with the company after that, even though they used his image all the time. Um, from 1892 until probably the mid to late 50s, um, it was on an upward trajectory uh, constantly, except for a little blip in the Depression for a couple of years. But even then, they, they had a lot of orders during the Depression. So GE was always strong. Alco was going downhill pretty quickly. They closed in 1969. They had about 12,000 workers during the 60s. So GE was the only game in town from 1970 till now, the only large, you know, um, multinational corporation. Um, they started laying, they started disseminating their businesses in the 1950s because of the 1946 strike. Um, GE was successful in keeping uh, unions at bay until about 1938 or 39, and then they also, the war came, and they, um, all the unions signed a loyalty pact saying they wouldn't strike during the war. So 1946 arrived and bam, huge strike started, and that's when GE started to get angry. Um, they went to the feds, a guy named Lemuel Boulware uh, went to the feds and got new legislation passed that really hindered unions' ability to strike. And they started selling businesses off and moving them all over the country. And they opened, I think in about 10 years, they opened 100 new cities with GE plants. And then when Jack Welch showed up in 1980, they had already been laying people off, but Welch showed up and he sold everything. He sold everything he could and turned it into a financial company. And the stockholders were thrilled because they were making huge amounts of money. So the shareholders in GE didn't mind. Um, but they laid off, between 1960 and 1990, they laid off approximately 40,000 workers in a city that at that point was about 69 or 70,000 people. It's a lot of people, 40,000. And the ripple effect of that, of course, is terrible because you've got people who abandon, you know, houses that were duplexes that they lived in with their families, their parents, and all of a sudden, early 90s, people started abandoned houses, zombie houses, people from downstate in the five boroughs started moving north and renting. So you go from family owned and operated houses all over the city to I think it was 52 or 55 percent renters in about 10 years and all the problems that come with that. So GE was, uh, you know, I mean, it's still pretty influential. In the 1990s, right before Philip arrived, they spent $400 million on their campus. Not a dime of it went to the city. And they did that because when new hirees, new applicants to GE came to the city, they wouldn't move there because it was such a dump. So they said, all right, let's really make a beautiful campus. They added swimming pools, tennis courts, all kinds of stuff. So that was all for hiring practices. I mean, it was a lot lower than when you came here. Sorry what uh, Mayor Teresi, uh, what your friend said, because I covered it in 1985. I came to the Times Union in 84. I covered Schenectady in 1985 for a brief time, less than a year. Karen Johnson was mayor. She's a wonderful person. I know she worked for Proctors and was close to you. But you start the book in 1987. Canal Square is burning. This strange concept for this canal, which was really kind of a small sewage uh, runoff area. Anyway, it never really worked, but it was so downtrodden, the fire started, and it's a great opening. Was that the nadir? I mean, the 1979, when the pipes burst and water's coming down, the, the aisles are, I mean, 87 wasn't not the worst. Close. I thought that was it was sort of the worst. high point. <laughs> <laughs> canal Square was burning, though, right? There was so much trash in it. And uh -huh. No, the square was, the, the canal wasn't canal. burning. Um, canal Square opened in 1982 and actually won an award from Ronald Reagan. Schenectady got the top award for urban planning in the country in 1982. And Le Grand Saris went to Washington, met with Reagan, took, got the award, came back, and they foreclosed on the property the next day. 
So the I, I never told you this because I didn't know, but now's the time to in front of everybody. Because wh why come to one of these if We're you don't making learn news something here. new? Exactly. Who's going to tweet this out? Phil? But my very good friend Joan Brooks was with Legrand <laughs> in D.C. and has her story to tell, which includes um, revealing that they were about to collapse at the award ceremony and Legrand being angry at her and not talking to her for the, the, the trip back or for the next week. Very funny though, but she was there working for, <laughs> having worked for the city. Legrand's a trip. <laughs> But what happened is it opened in 82 and they had a canal that went uh, behind all the stores, right? Was the water ever flowing? It was dry. The water was when flowing. They okay. had paddle boats. Actually, there's, there's a picture of a paddle boat in the canal in the book. Um, it lasted for about a year and a half, but it started to leak into the basements of the buildings. So, and plus, there are a lot of things they won't talk about, right? It's connected, he's kind of quiet about things, but kids from Hamilton Hill started coming down and using it as a swimming pool. Well, they didn't like that, right? right. And in the winter time, when they tried to skate, all the concrete started to crack. So they had to take it out, they had to fill it in. Right. So they filled it in. The problem with the fire is that um, nobody really cared that it was burning. I mean, there, there wasn't much to burn, right? They had no traffic. This was 1987. They'd been bankrupt for four years. You know, the entity that, that owned it was bankrupt. Um, this is where Angelo Mazzone started his empire, Peggy's Canal Side. This little sandwich shop you, you open with him in the fire scene, which is a great opening. I think Angelo was my third interview for this book. And we were over at, um, oh, what's the place in Scotia? Oh, uh, Glenn, Glenn Sanders. Sanders. Glenn Sanders, thank you. We're upstairs in Glenn Sanders, and Angelo's not a great interview. He kind of mumbles and, you know, doesn't really stay on topic. And at one point, he kind of turned away and said, oh, goddamn fire. And I said, what? What fire? And he said, oh, my restaurant burned. And I said, tell me about that. So he told me about it, and I thought, that's the beginning of the book. Right. What, what lower point can you have than an urban mall that isn't working, that's gone bankrupt, and it, it, it has a fire. Sure, it's much lower. You can go I lower. Know, you can go, go lower, lower, Philip. Go lower. Which they did. Well, in 2000, before I was here, there was nothing left. There was a sub shop. And I love this story. There were two dollar stores that were closed. Uh, I mean, <laughs> how do you close a dollar store? How do you right? close a dollar store in a, in a poor town? Well, when they started building that mall, the building in the middle collapsed. So they had to clear it out and let and that be the, one of the entrances to the mall. Well, that's what created the pond. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to happier times, though, because all those, those, those big construction photos, and they're still going. These are wonderful historic photos that Bill pulled together. And, and Nick Yetto, uh, amazing web person, put this uh, together. Um, but the, this was the good times. So you came in major expansion. The only reason you have these amazing touring Broadway musicals is because you came in and put a lot of money in expanding everything behind Proctor's. Talk about what you did first. And do you have a vision, or, or is you kind of making it up as you go along? Did you know you were going to no, do no, no, all these neither. things? No, 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 neither. I mean, you never know what you're going to do, right? Though that's not right. Um, at the same time, the board of... Proctors at the time had been in negotiations with the mayor of Albany about which theater should expand because both knew that only one could survive financially with a big stage and big Broadway and all that. And there was an agreement that was signed by the Schenectady mayor. Interestingly enough, he, the Schenectady didn't own proctors and was awaiting signature by the mayor of Albany uh, who didn't sign it and of course Albany did own Proctor, uh, the palace at the time that the palace would do the big stage expansion and proctors would be management um, but the mayor never signed it and the, when I arrived my three biggest jobs were figure out what's going on with this and then figure out how we move forward because the region needs the ability to look like a big city. You know, um, again, I'm going to go back to my suburb and surrounded by cities analogy. Buffalo had done the big stage expansion, bring Phantom of the Opera in kind of thing. 
15, 18 years before we did, 20 maybe, because the four small cities, none of them were big enough to do it unless someone thought about it in a bigger way. Um, so when it was clear that there was not going to be a political solution to the question of which one, um, we did our homework to say we think we can do it. We did the marketing analysis, we did the architectural uh, initial work, we did uh, the fundraising analysis to say we think we can pull this off. And the board approved proceeding. Now a lot's changed along the way there. Um, but the big thinking was out on the on the street well before I got here, and my job was to take the big thinking and implement whatever really would happen with that big thinking. Why has Metroplex been so successful? Philip says there's nothing else like it, the sales tax revenue. Um, but the politics in Schenectady, you get into it, they've been divisive and challenging. Race is a big issue. You don't walk away, you get into it in this book. Why has Schenectady's Metroplex been so successful? And I think it has. Anyone who goes to downtown Schenectady regularly, and yeah. certainly Proctor's is the heart and soul of it, but it's impressive. Well, the beginning is the funding stream. Um, some years, if the sales tax is good, they get 10 million bucks. That's a lot of money. Plus, they have bonding authority, I think, for 50 million more. So they can, they can start a lot of projects, but more importantly, they're an independent authority. And this, um, when Pataki signed this into law in 1998, nobody really understood how, really how vast their powers were, except for Frank Potter, who was county manager. And he was very upset about it, because the county ledge realized, we're, we're losing our power here. This independent authority is gonna be able to go and do whatever they want. Um, and everybody was afraid of eminent domain, especially in the neighborhoods, because even though there were corridors that, that you know, Metroplex was supposed to work in, people were worried that their, their houses were gonna be taken over by eminent domain. That didn't happen so much. But um, those are the two main reasons. But yeah, I mean, you do have to say that Ray Gillen has been a force since 2004. Uh, before him, John Manning was chair, and uh, Jamie, Jamie LaHutt came in as executive director early on in 1999, and they did some good projects. If you go on the, the website at Metroplex, they don't talk about this, but they did the MVP building, which is very important at the top of State Street. They did the DOT building, which they is They did down. Proctors. They, did, they, they mostly did Proctors, well, yeah. I mean, it was before Ray. Yeah, yeah, right. it was. So they did a whole lot of good stuff, and they laid the groundwork, but John Manning um, went back to Pataki and said, okay, I want to know exactly what our powers are. And Taki said, you're independent authority. Right. Nobody can tell you what to do. So that's the reason they're successful. So well, that, with that end, the politics of the community changed. And, and it went from highly divisive to... To all democratic. To almost all democratic. And with that political change came the ability to consolidate the alphabet soup of development stuff that had emerged over the 30 years before that. And all that sits underneath Ray and Metroplex now. And so yep. IDA authority on top of Metroplex authority on top of Rotterdam IDA on top. I mean, the, all these players, all these institutional players came under one umbrella. And that makes a big difference too. When Ray Gillen came in in 2004, there were 27 independent economic development authorities in Schenectady. I think now there are four, pretty much all under, under Metroplex. And the city, I spent a lot of time, knew him well, covered him. Frank Ducey, beloved carrier, character in the history of the city, but that city was not really going to progress or go forward under his tenure. I mean, he did some good things. Karen Johnson came in on, we won't get into politics, but one of the biggest, I think, uh, transformative projects is the casino Mohawk Harbor in the last 10 or 15 years. You were initially very concerned. You got an agreement that a certain set aside, a competing, non-compete clause. I'm trying to remember the, the things. Do you see it as a positive thing now? Has it impacted Proctor's? You view it as more or less positive in the book as a development that Metroplex got behind. I, th I think that's what I, what I read. But how do you see that big project? My wife and I and friends, we like going there to Druthers or Shaker and Vine and seeing the marina and sometimes they have concerts so, there. It seems nice, but is it is it good for the city? Is it how draw away you, from downtown? How can it not be good to take a largely abandoned 
soiled site and figure out how to clean it, bring it above the floodplain and make it usable. So good is the wrong word, superlative. Um, does it harm downtown? Well, until COVID, I would say no. During COVID, it's a little harder to tell because it's downtown's still clawing itself back a bit. Um, but long term, it, downtown will be fine too. Um, and certainly, the relationships between the developers and all, it's not a contested set of relationships. It's just the reality that the casino opened more fully, more quickly than Proctor's could open, and therefore its related stuff reopened more quickly, more fully than the stuff that's right around Proctor's. It's just going to be a little longer time on the downtown side. Do you see it as a superlative too? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great thing. But I, I think um, there's a lot happening downtown now that isn't happening up there. Um, you know, I mean, Dave, Dave Bucco and Gillespie developed Mohawk Harbor, and they still have some room to do some other things. They're talking about an aquatic center and maybe a new rink for, for Union College. Um, but, you know, I mean, Jeff Fuel is putting a whole new building in on State Street. Mill Artisan just went in at, the, at Lower State Street. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening in downtown. Um, and there's so many more people who live in downtown than live up in Mohawk Harbor. I don't think, I, don't, I just don't think downtown is going to suffer. I think it's going to do better. I'll ask one more question, then we'll uh, invite audience questions. You, you title that chapter, Can the Arts Save Schenectady? I wonder how you answer it. And then, Philip, especially, we haven't even gotten into the last two years have been brutal. The pandemic, from a $30 million budget to zero, and what, like hitting the brake and, and throwing everybody out of the car. I mean, terrible. I want to talk about how that's coming back, but can the arts save Schenectady? Has it? Can it? Will it? Well, that's a, there's a logical question around that and a philosophical question. It depends on what you feel about the arts. Um, I believe the arts are extremely important. I mean, you could tell from the reading that I chose. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to sound, you know, pompous here about this, but without the arts, what do you have? You have a kind of survival oriented, business-oriented life. Um, living in Schenectady would not be a lot of fun without Proctor's, without um, all the other things that are happening in town. But Proctor's is the main thing. But you've got the Light Opera Company, you've got Mopco, you've got Hamilton Hill Arts Center, you've got the Union, uh, Union College um, Chamber Music Series, you got SCC, which used to have a much, much larger jazz program than they had now. Empire State Jazz Orchestra used to be there. But there's an incredible jazz scene in Schenectady. Life would not be as good in Schenectady without all these cultural things. And, and I think that's important. I think we have to elevate ourselves. Um, otherwise, you just, you know, work and you fix your house up and raise your kids. And not, I'm not disparaging any of that. That's all good. But I think the arts have an elevating quality that we really need. I want to answer a little differently because so many times people on the street say to me, um, you know, Philip, you saved Schenectady, which of course I didn't save Schenectady, and I know I didn't save Schenectady, but what I take credit for, for Proctor's, is that at a dismal time, in the middle of a long dismal time, we took a leap of faith that required belief. And that instigated other people believing. You know, the, I think our our role in this historically is going to be one of the first, not the first, but one of the first most significant community reinvestments after the decline, the rocking to the bottom of General Electric. And out of that came other people doing it. One of the things I note about our downtown is there are very few national chains. There's none. It's all local money. It's all local people. And I, I kind of go, wow, this is incredible. Um, from 
Mexican radio. It doesn't matter. I can name them all. But it's all private local dollars, the Malozis. The, and I just think that um, it's that sense of, we're going to do this, damn it. And I think, uh, I know I heard that from the owners of the casino when they were looking at this as a site, whether they would apply and everything else. They walked through Proctor's and they walked through the downtown and went, you know, without that, I don't think we'd do this. But we see what you can do. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Let me say a couple of other quick things. Um, My wife, Carmel, and I went to see Come From Away at Proctor's a few days ago, and we were completely blown away by it. But as I was sitting there, I was thinking, where else can I do this except Broadway? You know, I mean, I have to fly to London and go to the West End, or I can go to Broadway, or you know, maybe go all the way to Buffalo or something. But there I was in Schenectady watching an incredibly moving show. It was just terrific. The second half of my book is about livability, right? Why for all those years from, say, 1975 to 2008 or 9, didn't anybody want to go to Schenectady? Nobody wanted to move there. You had police corruption, you had a crack epidemic, you had uh, a totally failing downtown, you had a city that was close to bankruptcy. Um, It it was a total mess. Nobody wanted to live there. You had a terrorist essentially running the high school, all the schools, the school system. Um, It was a total mess. And every time you opened the newspaper, whether it was the TU or the Troy Record or the Gazette, you saw another terrible story about Schenectady. Who'd want to move there? Well, when you clean all that up, and then you get to go to Proctor's and have this incredible emotional experience, that makes you want to live in a place, right? And so I think the reason Schenectady has come back is they've dealt with almost all of these livability factors. And they're starting to do it in the neighborhoods. It's taken a a little longer, but they're pouring a lot of money into Mount Pleasant, into Hamilton Hill. And I think, uh, I think the city is doing what a lot of other cities have, have not decided to do, which is, you know, all the boats have to rise with the tide, and they're going to make that happen there. It's pretty unusual. I will note, I was there for Bill's book launch at, at Proctor's in the GE Theater maybe two months ago now, but it was very emotional. Philip was very emotional. It was the first time in 18 months that that theater had been lights on, full of people. I know it's been a tough time during the pandemic. We're glad you're coming back. You got rent coming up. You got waitress coming up. Uh, um, so anyway, let's support Proctors, but we do have a great geography and planning department. I know there's a couple professors, urban planning specialists here. Bill is deeply versed in that subject, but we'd love to answer some audience questions, or they would. Microphone, by the way. So oh yes, Jen has a microphone. If you raise your hand, you can uh, be heard by everyone. Thank you. Um, I was, uh, I run a, a downtown agency in Gloversville, New York, and so we're modeling a lot of what's happening. We've, we've used uh, Schenectady in multiple instances to, to try to look at a model of some local, uh, local feasibility studies in practice, and especially centering around economic development focused on arts and development. So we have a much smaller theater, half the size, um, if that. But again, it's situated very similarly to where Proctor's is in the overall landscape of downtown. And one thing that we've slept on um, and has been uh, significantly underutilized is the presence of a historic district. And so I would like to know what the process was to declare Proctor's a national historic site and the significance that had in the overall capital campaign and any implementation sort of recommendations you would make. Um, in my professional career, all I've done is renovate historic properties. So in Jamestown, there were four. Um, and Proctor's, the whole Proctor's complex, the new capital rep is in a historic property, and UPH in Saratoga is a historic property. Um, the economic value of that is pretty substantial if you leverage them with historic tax credits. In the case of Schenectady, it was another 10 million bucks out of the 44 million that we needed to pull off that whole huge project. Um, but more importantly, it's a statement about place, right? This property matters. And as I said about what I think Proctors will be remembered for in the 80s, in, in the 2000s, is going to be 
the community stood up and said, stop, this is going to stop, this is our first, we're going to take a leap, and people will leap with us. And um, I think that's the value of historic properties. Thank you. You, you know, another part of your question, I think there were separate um, things, right? Um, Dennis Madden was execu executive director in 1980 when they got it on the National Register of Historic Places, and Philip didn't come till 2002, and the capital campaign was 2005, right? No, no, uh, three. Oh, you we, started we it in three? We opened 2005. Oh, that's right, that's right, yeah. So they were, they were separate, those two things. But you're utilizing those, leveraging, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Leveraging uh, those historic tax credits uh, didn't happen with the capital campaign. So you had, you had a significant being uh, registered place, but you didn't utilize the credits until 2000. Oh, that's correct. I mean, I think early on the original volunteers and Dennis did it just. As a uh, as a guarantee that the demolition resolution that had sat before the city council was never finally approved, or maybe it was approved, it was approved, would never be executed. So it was a protection, yeah. absolutely. And then in two thousand two, three, four. In fact, I don't think there was such a thing as historic tax credits. They came with Ronald Reagan. Um, so. Um, and, and you almost didn't get that money. <laughs> that book, that story is told in the book. Oh my, yes. <laughs> they, they refused at first to give Proctor's the money, and Philip had to go to Washington and appeal it. Mr. Morris goes to Washington. It sounds right. like a play. That's right. And and I've kept the letter because I told Bill the story. I think it's in the book. I don't remember. Yeah, it's uh, in there. <laughs> you have convinced me, if barely, <laughs> that, that this deserves those credits. You know, <laughs> barely. I'll never forget. You're not looking to go to Gloversville since you're in Albany and Saratoga. You might need to talk to him, young man, afterwards. Who knows? Um, but anyway, who's got another question for... Thank you. Forgive me, I have an impossibly broad question, too broad a question. Um, my hometown was Ticonderoga, New York, and I watched the Walmart and the McDonald's moving outside of town, and all the local mom and pop businesses on Main Street fold. Most of them are still empty today. And now in my own hometown where I live now, which I will not name, but is nearby, um, a wonderful new little mom and pop coffee shop opened. And then the town fathers went ahead and approved a Dunkin' Donuts, which is coming into the center of town. And I can't imagine how the little local coffee shop will sustain itself. So my overly broad question is, how on earth do we convince town officials to really look for the greater good to preserve local businesses instead of just giving in to chains. And I was prompted by your comment in which you said, we don't have any chain businesses in downtown Schenectady. How on earth did you pull that off? Thank you. There's a bit of accident in that, and there's a bit of strategy in that. What I mean by the strategy is that when we went forward to to argue that Proctor's needed to be the first major project that I will never forget this day because we had about 75 or 80 people that are organized by a long-term organizer who has since passed away who was Karen Trump's best friend. And the state was very clear we were going to be first. Everybody else in 75 were below the the guy that had opened the official. It was local business people who were in the room arguing that the most significant thing to do next would be to do the state tradition and the expansion of projects. So the Philip, strategy was I'm going to have different. you pause. I think you muted your mic, so we're going to switch. The strategy was doing always engaging local entrepreneurs in all our conversations, always which led to the accident of there not being chains, and it's an accident, because public officials are desperate for development. Ours were too. And when you're desperate, you'll take anything, even if it puts a parking lot on the street in the middle of your downtown first. I mean, it just it's, it's, it's the nature of despair, especially when 
it is a hunger game. You know, and that's the way America is. We are a hunger game. Do you have a question? Do you have a yep. I, I think it's an uphill battle trying to convince people who are interested in profit. Um, but if you can have local businesses that show they'll turn the same kind of profit and give the same kind of tax base, then I think local officials might listen. But still, I think it's an uphill battle. Yeah. Okay, uh, just a... Uh, Sorry, just, we're all just, set. Just to give, Go give, ahead. give my own chronology, I, I came to Schenectady 60 years ago to work for General Electric when there was 25,000 people there, and the locomotive company had, I think, 350 buildings there on the site. And then 30 years ago, no, literally 40 years ago, that, that reactor there, I was the only person on that site. I, was, I, I ran that for three or four years, and so I, I usually was the only person in there. And, uh, and then, uh, I guess in 1995, I was on this, uh, what it was called, Schenectady 2000 Bicycle Path Committee. And one issue was on uh, North J Street, and that was kind of run down. And you know, the other committee members wanted to figure out how to route their bicycles around J Street because they didn't want to see it. And I kind of talked them into saying that's the cultural center of Schenectady, and, and it turned into the cultural center of Schenectady, but I think, think the next step for uh, uh, Philip, are, are you going to open up uh, that tunnel to get to North J Street? Is that your question? Are they going to yeah, yeah, the questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really... North Chase, uh, it's a little Italy there, but it's kind of hard to get to. Yeah, I was saddened when North J was, um, and this may not interest everybody, but I was saddened when North J was terminated. It used to hit not, and it didn't make a lot of sense to, uh, it used to, excuse me, turn and hit Erie Boulevard. It never made a lot of sense to me while we got rid of it. But the plan and the funding is in place for that tunnel to happen and a number of things in the downtown recovery, downtown DRI, downtown <laughs> renewal uh, initiative are around connecting the downtown to the harbor and as long as we can keep our head around the fact that we need to connect the two things, then I think we're going to be just fine. Yeah. And I don't know if that's what you were really asking. Just my final comment. I was I, I, I was not enthusiastic over the casino, but I think it turned it really turned out fantastic. And the reason is it's much more than a casino. You know, it's, it's really the core for many many other good things there. Yeah, the quality of the people who run it is remarkable, really. I, I think it's remarkable, and I, I, I never, I don't play, so I never go, except maybe once in a while to hear a musician that's there. Um, but thank God, we, the theaters of the three state regions that had casinos, were able to negotiate away with the state for a bit of protection. So not, not having the ability to have a performance of over a thousand, which all the casinos agreed to, including the one that's at Rivers, which was before we knew it was going to be at Rivers, is a big boon to us. Otherwise, they could be pretty competitive with us. I mean, in, in Connecticut, they're taking everything away from Hartford, everything. Maybe one more question, yeah. or two more. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The um, this is changing the subject quite a lot, but um, the thing that I most remember about the economic development and economic crisis of Schenectady was when a mayor was trying to promote foreign immigration entrepreneurs, uh, especially from Guyana, and um, I'm wondering. What happened to all of that? Did it happen? Oh, yeah. Did it um, change Schenectady? Bill's got Bill has it in the book, and Schenectady. it's still going on, and it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, Al Jerzynski was the mayor. Um, there was a man named Derek Singh 
who was a manager at Stewart's who had come from Queens, New York, and he went to Al Jarzynski and said, you know, I think you're missing the boat here. There are a lot of Guyanese who, who might like to move from the city up here. So Al Jarzynski went down and met with a man named Herman Singh who ran a radio program, and they started attracting people, and they started running a bus from um, Queens, and I think one from Brooklyn also, up to the city once a week, and they would have a tour, Al Jarzynski would literally get them on a bus and take them around the city and give them a tour for three hours. And then they had job fairs, and I think they had about 2,000 Guyanese move within about a year. And it's been so successful that I think now 10% of the population of Schenectady is Guyanese. So it was, it came at a time, you know, between 1998 and 2002, when nobody wanted to move there. Nobody wanted to move to Schenectady. And all of a sudden you had thousands of people who were hardworking immigrants who said, you know what, I can have a life there. I can have a better life there for less money than I have here downstate. And they took a risk and moved here and they've been wildly successful, wildly. There's one there and then one way in the back will be the last question, I think. Yeah, thank you for mentioning the Department of Geography and Planning. We're representatives in this row here. Um, I haven't had a chance to, to look at your book yet, Mr. Patrick, but I guess I'd like to ask about Metroplex. Um, there were a lot of doubters at first. <clears throat> now there are no more doubters. But as urban planners, we often look at um, the whole synergy of what's going on in a community, and a Metroplex is so unique as you said, it's one of a kind, and it has such a funding source, it's very hard for us to look at Schenectady and provide that as an example to other communities, to the Gloversvilles or other Troy's even of the world, and Troy's doing it on its own without Metroplex. So um, just a comment, I guess more than anything, but would you say that we would have come as, this far in Schenectady without the Metroplex? And should we look at doing others in the state of New York? Uh, no, we would not have come this far by any means. Um, and yeah, I think every city who could afford to do it would do it. I don't think they will because it's a political question. And, and that was the problem in Schenectady. Uh, you know, Bob Farley, this was just an idea that Bob Farley had. He was a counsel to the Senate. Um, and he was a good friend of Neil Golub's. He had this idea and he said to Neil, this is gonna be really tough to do, but if we pull it off, it might be a great economic development authority. So he started writing the legislation and he's really the reason that it got passed. The legislature did not wanna pass it. Nobody had an idea what it was. I mean, Farley, um, is a very nice guy, but he's very long-winded. And when he wrote that legislation, nobody understood it. They had no idea what it was, right? So for them, for the legislature, it was just Frank Potter and Bob McAvoy, who was county manager at the time, said, um, you know, our money can go other places. Bob McAvoy especially was very charitable and very penny-pinching, and he didn't want to give any money to Metroplex. So it won't happen in the rest of the state because county ledges all over will say, uh-uh, you're not taking all the power away from us, right? And give it to an independent authority. They get to do what they want and we don't have any power anymore. But yeah, I think a lot of people should try that model if they could just trust that it would work for them. But Schenectady, no way it would have come as far without Metroplex. No way. Thank you. Uh, hi, I, I just wanted to pick your brain about, the. you cited before an importance of aesthetics and artwork when it comes to the rejuvenation of local communities, and I sort of wanted to pick your brain about that, because I'm from Cohoes, New York, which is about 20 minutes from I'm here. I'm sorry, from where? Cohoes, New York. Oh yeah, of course, Cohoes. Uh, yeah. Music hall, great place. Yeah, it's a lovely city, at least in my opinion. Um, although, one thing I've noticed is recently we've had a bit of an economic sort of upturn. We've had a lot of local businesses come in, and we've been able to stave off sort of the interjection of like large chains and we've had a lot of like mom and pop businesses come around and sort of rejuvenate parts of the local area. The thing I've noticed though is even still after that, a lot of the younger uh, parts of the generations in Cohoes are still dissatisfied with the situation in Cohoes and are leaving like after they grow up. 
One thing I wanted to ask you about is, do you think that like these places like Proctor's, these cultural centers, I think a previous question sort of you know, phrased it, these aesthetic like experiences are valuable for the creation of not only an economic incentive and rejuvenation, but also a sort of regional cultural one that is necessary for a general sort of overhaul of a city. Do you think the, the, these areas or these centers are huge steps in preserving a certain degree of uh, community identity that is necessary for improvement? Yes. <laughs> but Philip should answer this because he's made Proctor's a cultural center with all kinds of really great programs for local kids, high school kids, regional high schools. So can you talk about that a little? I think if we opened our doors eight weeks a year for Broadway alone, what, is happened, what has happened in Schenectady would not have happened. Um, until COVID, we were open 365 days a year, 364 days a year, um, from 8 in the morning until 11 at night every day. And we had 3,000 events on that property and attracted 750,000 people. That is what creates dynamism. Um, so we think of ourselves as the community's living room with a big ass huge screen TV, you know, with the biggest, bestest live entertainment facility at the heart of it, but still the community's living room and memorial services and weddings and meetings and, you know, walk in and get a cup of coffee when that was all open. Um, uh, we did it all and we'll do it all again and our education program is significant and, you know, I, I don't know, I think part of that is about an attitude which is not simply come in, spend 60 bucks and have a seat, but we're here for this place. I mean, yeah. You know, one other thing that has to be said, and this is going to sound Pollyanna-ish, but I've lived all over this country. Schenectady is the first city I've lived in where I felt completely welcomed from day one. People are just friendlier in that city. I don't know why, but they are. And part of that is because Philip and Proctor's has created this sense of community in the place. That's not to say that there isn't all kinds of you know politics and bickering and you know the same kinds of things that happen everywhere, but it's a really friendly town. Um, and I think you kind of have to start with that, people with a good attitude. It will come back. I just love those nights when I'm there and there's a stand-up comic downstairs. There's some kind of large film at the GE Theater. There's a Broadway show or a big music act on the main stage. And up in the Addy, which we love going, a beautiful little art film. I mean, four things going at once. A wedding, you all. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this was a wonderful conversation. It always reminds me, we do have the best audiences here. Great questions. This book, this is, I've known Bill for a long time. This is his 10th and it's his best. I mean, it is a brilliant piece of research, scholarship, but storytelling as well. The combative comeback of a company town, Metrofix. We're very pleased to have Philip Morris and William Patrick. Please give them a big round of applause.